Today we're talking hardscaping and we're going, we're going into the basics. Now I always say there's not really a shortcut or a hack when it comes to things like hardscaping. And so we're gonna have some fairly dense slides. I'm sorry, it's, it's the only way I could do this because when we are installing these different hardscaping features in, in our gardens and yards, Sometimes they can be significant structural elements. Retaining walls are holding back earth. Patios are holding us up. And we don't want to be tripping over things or, or having to deal with failures in these. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of bullet points. Tried to get as many pretty pictures as I could, but we're going to be getting into the nuts and bolts of it. And it is the basics. We really don't have time to get into how to do curves, how to do steps, you know, some of the various other specialty features that you could do with the retaining wall or with the patio. In addition, it's kind of tough to do this online. I've done this in person before where we can do like demonstrations, hands-on stuff about uh, different types of block and things. But if you have questions, please throw those in the chat box during the course of this. I'll do my best to answer those questions in the hour that we have together. But let's get started now in terms of retaining walls. So really hardscaping is essentially, well, exactly what the name implies. As landscapers, we aren't very creative in that. The hardscaping is, well, the hard stuff. Could be a wall, patio, stone, stepping stones, all of the hard features that we have out in our yards and gardens. So first we're gonna talk about retaining walls and folks, there's a lot of different retaining walls out there, but we can divide them into two basic types. We have solid retaining walls and we have modular retaining walls. So solid retaining walls, so pictured here, that top picture right there is a concrete wall. You can see the top is narrower than the, the base, which is much wider. And essentially this is a gravity wall. It's using gravity or its sheer mass of this object to hold it and the soil behind it in place. Now, over history, we have started doing this with earth. And a lot of times we still have earthen dams with a similar detailing to its, to its section that you would cut through that. And then we use stone and today we use a lot of concrete. We might reinforce this with steel, which would be rebar. And in this case, I don't see any on that failing wall in that picture. Doesn't mean it's not there though. We also have cantilever walls. Now these are usually poured in place concrete. It's an upright concrete slab, which is then keyed or locked into a horizontal unit that's buried underground. Now the weight of the soil sitting on that horizontal unit at the back is what holds that vertical piece upright. It keeps that soil from shifting that vertical piece over and down. That's solid walls. We also have modular or we call them flexible walls. So lots of different materials in this case, you know, tie and timber are your typical railroad tie construction walls. But then we also have CMU. Now that's the term that I like to use. It stands for concrete masonry unit. It goes by a lot of different names. There's SWU, segmental wall unit, IMU, all the, all the U's out there. So this is a very popular type of wall. We also have gabions, which is pictured on that top left photograph right there. It's essentially steel cages with stone inside. It could be uh, stone harvested from a quarry or it could be concrete ground up as refuse from a reclamation of a construction site. And of course we have dry laid stone. Now this is modular so long as we don't mortar it in place and then we call it a rigid structure. With all these walls out here, how do we even have time to talk about all this? Well, folks, we are going to be concentrating on one type. We're gonna be fo focusing on the modular module block wall or the CMU. You probably recognize these. This is what you find very commonly at any of the big box or at your local garden centers. This is the stuff available and accessible to you, the homeowner. So there are issues that can arise when building these. Now these are very small. I don't know if I would even call these retaining walls. These are just more decorative border blocks. But even in this case, 
you can see failures occurring. You can see blocks shifting because of tree roots or shifting because uh, just not proper uh, a base was created in these small walls. Now we're gonna talk about things today in terms of retaining walls for probably larger type retaining walls. It might be overkill for something like this, but even still, proper preparation of that subsurface underneath there is important, which will then help you avoid things like this where you have to come in later on to fix, say, a failed retaining wall. Because if you can avoid picking these heavy blocks up, that's, that helps me, you, your back, everybody. It's a good benefit. So the first question I usually get asked, okay, I want to build a retaining wall. How tall can I make my wall? Well, most of the block that you'll see at your big box store, home garden centers, they are specified to only go about four foot max in terms of the height. Not only is that a manufacturer specification, there are a lot of municipal codes and regulations that require any wall greater than four foot needs to have additional engineering. So if you're thinking, well, I have that eight foot retaining wall, I never did anything extra. Well, that, that goes against uh, the, the specifications and perhaps even your local municipal code. So just something to keep in mind, that is the maximum height for our retaining walls, for most retaining walls. What do I mean by additional engineering? Essentially, you need to take the retaining wall specifications to an engineer, a structural geotechnical a soils type engineer who can create a plan like you see on the right side of the screen that might have to include additional reinforcement. Now, how, what type of additional reinforcement? Well, that's going to depend on your property on your site because only you or then the engineer would know exactly what soil type you might have because that varies wherever you're at in terms of your geography. And so they can specify specifically for that. They put their stamp on it. That way you can build it to those specifications. So a lot of folks say, okay, well, if I can't have an eight foot retaining wall, I'll just push one wall back a little bit and I'll have two retaining walls. That's fine, but you need to make sure that you have the appropriate horizontal distance to be able to accomplish that goal. Because the rule of thumb is that the horizontal distance between walls should be double the wall height. So that top, so you see one, two, and I believe this is three retaining walls in this picture. I think that's just a decorative uh, kind of centerpiece right there, although I could be wrong. The angle is a bit odd, uh, but I think there's only three retaining walls here. The bottom wall, if you measure the height of that wall and then you measure the vertical distance, or sorry, the horizontal distance between the second one up, the middle retaining wall, that is not, is certainly not double the height of that first retaining wall. So what does that mean? That means that first retaining wall, it's designed to only support four feet of soil. It is now supporting the retaining wall above it too. That's called a surcharge. We'll talk about that here in the next couple slides. So rule of thumb, horizontal distance between walls needs to be double the wall height. We do this because retaining walls have to resist failure. They have to resist the forces of nature that want this wall to fall over. These are vertical and horizontal forces. And really there's three ways. I know there's four images here, but the, the bottom two are kind of the same. But there's really three ways that retaining walls fail. The first is by overturning. So the top comes over the bottom. The next is sliding. So essentially, soil forces push that wall out of its original alignment and placement. And then third is it settles or it fails backwards and it turns on itself. Those are the three basic ways that forces of gravity, soil, moisture, all of these things come into play that, to allow your retaining wall to fail. So. 
we have to know, first off, what is your wall going to be retaining? And I mentioned surcharge earlier. The surcharge is that area of soil or other material that that wall is holding back. Now you can have static surcharge, which means that there's no change, or you can have dynamic surcharge, which in the, that line drawing here, we see a, an automobile. That's dynamic. That car is not always there. Sometimes it's a car, sometimes it's a pickup. Well, what if it's a semi-truck sometimes? That surcharge load is changing. Ideally, the soil at the top of your retaining wall needs to be the same height as that top, that top capstone. You can see in the image on the, on the left side of the screen that soil actually comes down a little bit lower than that retaining wall. That's to redirect excessive runoff water away from the top of that wall. But we really don't want our soil to be, you know, incredibly steep behind that wall. So we need to have a level surface. That's an ideal setting. That's a, that, that would be great if it could be level behind that wall because it minimizes the amount of additional surcharge put on that wall. Folks will ask, okay, can I plant, see in the image on the left, we have grass. Well, what about shrubs, perennials? That's okay. Usually, you know, you don't wanna be going overboard in terms of the amount of planting material because you can see in this construction detail, we are gonna be backfilling behind that wall with crushed rock. Might not be the best soil for a lot of our plant or landscape choices here in Illinois. But we do put a layer of topsoil on there, so maybe we could grow grass right up to it, or maybe bedding plants. Shrubs might need to be planted a little bit farther back from the wall. But what about trees? So trees actually present more of a dynamic surcharge. The larger the tree grows, the bigger of a wind sail it becomes. It creates more leaves, more surface area for that wind to catch on that canopy of that tree. So the more wind catching in that canopy, the more of that load has to be supported by the root system. And if you planted this right behind the wall, those roots are moving. That tree moves with strong winds. That is a dynamic surcharge. And typically I do not recommend the planting of anywhere from small up to large shade trees right behind a retaining wall. It depends on the site, of course. It depends on how much space you have for your tree. So there's a lot of things to be considered for a specific, you know, specific sites. But in general, typically don't recommend planting any large shade trees behind a wall. And I'm also very hesitant of smaller ornamental type trees. Well, how do we keep it all from failing? Well, let's talk about how we prepare the base in building this wall. So how far should you be digging down? Well, you need to go down deep enough to account for soil compaction because you're, you're disturbing the soil, no matter what you're doing. And every time we disturb the soil, if you've ever tilled a garden and you've tilled it over and over again, year after year, what do you notice? That area settles. And pretty soon your vegetable garden's lower than the rest of the yard. Every time you disturb the soil, you're disturbing the structure, you're getting settling. Also, what we will be doing in this case for our wall is we're gonna be compacting that soil. You have to accommodate for four to six inches of base material. And it is recommended to bury at least one course of block. So that first course, you're never gonna see that that should be underground. That should be below the soil line. You also wanna make sure you give yourself plenty of room to work. I have been on, on jobs where we've been putting in walls and we are fighting with each other because we don't have enough room to move block to where we need to put it. People have gotten hurt because trying to maneuver with these 40 to 80 pound blocks around other people that are working so make sure you have enough room to do your work. Usually we recommend to excavate anywhere from like up to two feet from the front and the back of the future wall. As I mentioned, bury that first course. That is the recommendation. 
And then we talk about base material. So base material is going to be a compactable gravel fill. I'll get into that here in the, the next slide. But we have to accommodate for that base material. That's essentially what we're setting our first row of blocks on. Now, how high or how thick does that base material need to be? Okay, we are going to assume you're building the max height at a four foot high wall. That means you're gonna use anywhere from four to six inches of sub base and it's gonna be compacted. So you'll have to then figure in that additional uh, compaction in maintaining a four to six inch sub base. We'll talk about compaction, the different types of compactors, but essentially your sub base should be compacted so that when you walk over it, it doesn't shift at all. You know, when you walk through a gravel driveway and, and your, your heels, you know, shifting behind you and it's moving gravel, your ankles turning, that should not be happening when you walk on this base material. It should be solid. So how do you compact it? Well, most of us, myself included, have a hand tamp or can go buy one or borrow one from a friend or a neighbor. It's essentially just a pole with a flat metal bottom. And we use that to tamp and compact the soil. You can rent plate packers, in this case, a, a rammer. Now, when I did landscaping, we called these whacker packers. That is what this gentleman here in this photo is demonstrating. It's essentially like, I call it a jackhammer with a plate on the bottom. And that bounces around and it compacts the soil in the sub in that base material. There have been instances where we have excavated for a, a retaining wall in new construction. And you know what happens when you build a home. All of that soil is mixed up and the structure is totally gone. The topsoil's out of there and you're left with like subsoil. I have been walking along with my whacker packer or rammer, packing down the soil before we put on that, that gravel base material. And the, the whacker packer just goes, shumph. it just drops down into the soil because I've hit a pocket of soil that has no structural cohesion, no structural integrity at all. You know, it's like hitting a pocket of sand. What do you do in that case? Well, you basically have to fill that with compactable gravel and compact it until it stops sinking. And sometimes we use wheelbarrows, wheelbarrows, plural, full of gravel in some of those spots. This is very common in new construction, especially around foundations if they don't compact that soil properly. If you're using a hand tamp, which is I think most of us will be, if you're, do, if you're homeowners, this is most of us are gonna be doing this, we're gonna be using a hand tamp. You cannot just dump six inches of gravel and compact that. Yeah, sure, you'll compact that top inch, but you will not get that full depth of that gravel compacted. Basically, you need to add one to two inches of lift. We call those lifts. So you add one to two inches, you use your hand tamp, you tamp that all down, add one to two more inches and tamp that all down. If you don't have much upper body strength, you're probably gonna be going with one inch. If you're a bit stronger and you have some good stamina, you can do two inches because this is gonna be a workout. Pictured on the right here is a vibratory plate packer. It can do lifts of four to six inches. Now I typically would probably go towards the minimum end for about four inches at a time. You can screed, which is dragging a board over the top of the gravel to kind of level it off before compacting. Now we've never done this except for when we're doing engineered walls, which means the engineer has given us a plan and we have to follow their specifications. And again, compact the base when you walk on it so there is no shift. All right, let's talk about this base material, this compactable gravel. What am I talking about? Well, industry, trade, they call it class five. It's angular, sharp, and it contains particles or fines such as, that, that are less than, than three quarter inch. What this does is these larger gravel combined with the smaller sizes of gravel, all the fine material, 
allow it, when you come over it with a compactor, it allows it to lock in place. I've seen several instances where homeowners, instead of using angular gravel, have used pea gravel at the recommendation of certain staff at certain large big box home and garden centers. Pea gravel is round. You can run a packer over that all day long. You cannot pack it enough to create a solid stable surface that does not shift when you walk on it because of the round, round material. It won't lock into place. So to illustrate this, because in person I would just show people, I would have buckets of either of both. On the left is that class five, the, the angular gravel that has the, the fines material. It's uh, slightly wet which means that allows it to uh, lock into place when you run a packer over it. On the right is, I think this is actually like a round river rock. This is more what we would put behind the wall for drainage. But pea gravel, it's out. This is not a, it's not a compactable thing. And any of that round river rock, no. This stuff on the left though, that's what you want as your base material. So, when we built walls, we would excavate, we would compact the soil underneath with that whacker packer, and then we would add our base material, that gravel that I just showed you, and then we would put the first course of block down. There are some recommendations that say you could then put down a layer of sand before you put down that first block. We've never done that. Sand, as we'll see with patios, has no, it, it, it doesn't, it's kind of like pea gravel. It doesn't lock in very well. So I've never used bedding sand, but you can go online. You can go on YouTube and you can see folks building retaining walls. And on top of that compacted gravel, they'll put a layer of sand. I typically have, again, I haven't done that. What we have used is a product called brick chip or also gravel fines. This is essentially like flat or plated, platey type material that is also compactable. So again, that, 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 that's what I have used before, but typically we place our first block on top of that compacted base, gravel. Now I have to make a note about batter. Now batter, is as you can see in this image here, you see how the blocks step backwards? That is a step back batter, that, that bat, it's a batter. Now, I can't really see it in this, in this image here, but this, these block are actually also tipped. So their back side is a little bit lower than their front side. This is just a, a little bit of extra help, an assist from gravity that allow that that prevents this wall from tumbling over you know that that tipping failure that we talked about the other reason why we do uh, especially step back batter if you've ever walked next to a a wall that is straight up and down it it feels a little uncomfortable kind of feels like it might fall right over on you at any minute so we also do it for an aesthetic purpose a feeling of comfort. Not only is it, does it add structural, not only is it a functional thing, but it's also an aesthetic feature. So batter is an important thing to remember if you're, say, you're using uh, cut stone like this. A lot of the CMUs, those block walls, have the batter designed into it. You've seen them. They have the little lip on the back that gives you that step back batter. So when you build your retaining wall, you're going to spend I, I, like three-fourths of your time on that first course. The first course is critical to getting this right. Any error, imperfection with this first course is going to get more and more noticeable the higher up you go on the wall. So it has to be perfect. I always say in, in horticulture and landscaping, there's not, you, you don't really have to be perfect, but really here, this is the moment where perfection counts. 
Before you start putting your block down, you've compacted your, your gravel, your base material. For straight runs of retaining wall, I set up a string line on the back of the wall. The string line is my guide. I'm not setting the block against the string line because then that would, I would, I would have it. Then my guide is then off. I set my block right next to it, not touching, just a hair can slide between the two. That's how you get a straight wall. You have to be very careful when you're setting your block down on your base material that you're not scooting it because then that can also affect the compaction. So if you get this right, the rest of the wall goes up quickly. As you can see in the image there on the bottom, this woman has actually, so the back side of the wall is where that fabric is. She has turned the blocks upside down and facing backwards. So that's one thing, that's one way you can, you can do your base as well. You can chip off that lip, but it's gonna be buried anyway. They do this so that the lip doesn't interfere with creating a level block. So that's one strategy for that. As you are setting your blocks down, I had a short torpedo level, you know, one foot, six inches. I had a longer two foot level and then an even longer still six foot level. We used all of them. So the, the short to torpedo level, that's checking individual blocks and maybe the block next to it after you set the next one down. So you're checking to make sure that the block is level side to side and then level front to back. Now, if you're gonna be putting a batter on your block, then you want the bubble of your level to be touching just, just the, the, the end of the bubble, just touching the line of that level. So just a slight batter. That's how you would do that. But usually for CMUs, you would just be, you would be level side to side and level front to back. You will then use a, you might have to use a rubber mallet or a, a, a dead blow to make minor adjustments. If you're a homeowner, you probably have a rubber mallet lying around sometime, somewhere. You may not. It's the cheaper one to buy. If you're going to be building multiple walls or a really big wall, you might want to invest in a dead blow hammer. That's what the person is using on that top picture. It's a dead blow. The rubber mallet bounces. We use these so they don't damage the blocks, but the rubber mallet, it bounces. The dead blow does what the name implies. You hit the block and it doesn't bounce. It transfers all that energy into that block. So you use those to make minor adjustments as you're setting that base course. If you need to add gravel to keep that level, do that. You can use a compactor, a hand tamp. I, I've used the block itself to pack that gravel down to, get my, to keep my blocks level. You also want to make sure the blocks are touching each other. Sometimes a tiny little piece of gravel gets in the way and you, you can't see it. So you'd have to make sure, making sure that, that there's no gravel getting in the way. For the interest of knees, lower backs, it is easier to have two people do this job. One person is setting the base course because as you'll learn, it is, there is a significant curve to, to figuring out how to do this. Having one person do that will help speed up the process because they'll get the hang of it. They'll get a rhythm. They'll get a flow. And so that they don't have to keep getting up, grabbing block, bringing it over, have that second person feeding them blocks as we go. And this is the base course. Again, this is a critical course to get built. And what do we put behind, directly behind that base course? Most of the time, the construction specifications will indicate the need for uh, drainage, some type of subsoil drainage. So here, uh, pictured on the left, is a perforated pipe, which is connected to an outlet that's built into the wall. This outlet, or sorry, this pipe, 
has holes in it so that as water fills in behind that wall, it goes into the pipe and drains out the, the outlet here. We do this because water is destructive. Water in soil creates a lot of pressure between soil particles and it can push them apart. So we wanna make sure that we, are, we have a good, well-drained area behind that wall. To facilitate that, we put in that clear gravel. So it doesn't have the fines, it doesn't have the, the small pieces in it. It's basically three quarter inch gravel that, that has, that, that's clean. As you can see in the picture, the middle one right there, it's just that, that white angular gravel. You put the perforated drain tile in. Sometimes like this, it's just a bare, bare pipe. Other times it has a fabric sock over it, which keeps silt particles from infiltrating into and clogging up the holes in the pipe. And then you cover that up with this three quarter inch clear gravel. And that's, it starts behind the first course. All right, well, we've got the first course built. What do we do now? Well, we build up. In terms of structure, we do not want to create, say, a tic-tac-toe board or like a grid. We want to offset or stagger that block, the, the next course, with the block that's below it. So see in this image here how they're not lining up end to end. They're lining up from that middle section. That's important because this, by staggering your block, it creates a stronger uh, it creates a stronger wall. If you've ever built with like play blocks or Legos, you know that's true. If you can stagger them, stagger your blocks, it's a stronger wall than if you just built single columns of block going up and down. One column will fail because it's all dependent upon that one block on the bottom. So here you can tie, you tie the block, the columns together, you get a stronger wall for it. You might need to cut or split blocks. Now, if I was in person, this is when we would pause and I would show you some tips and techniques for splitting block with either using, I wouldn't do it in person, but you know, using a diamond tipped uh, saw or even a mallet with a chisel. For solid concrete block, we would actually cut the block just with the mallet. It takes practice, but you can figure out where that line, where that where area is you wanna cut. You just strike that rock in a couple of key places and you also cross your fingers and it should split along that line. It doesn't always, but if you're in a jam and you don't have a saw or a chisel, that's one way to go. But for the block that you're seeing here, that wouldn't work. I'm talking solid concrete block. There's no holes or anything in it. As you're, you're building up row after row, some plans say, hey, pack down that drainage aggregate or that drainage gravel behind the wall. I've never done that. We have left that uncompacted, but we have filled it up. As you can see in the image here, the bottom, that round part, that's the drainage tile, and we've just been filling up with backfill material. Actually, usually we try to keep any compaction of the soil behind it we try to stay at least two to three feet away from the back of that wall because you can compact that area behind the wall and it creates enough shift in that soil that you start pushing out your wall and you're not even done building it. So yes, there are some places that instruct you can compact that gravel. I'll just say I haven't done that. To me, that would seem a little bit too risky. And as you're adding block upon block or course upon course, you're building up, you have to have a broom or some, something to sweep off the block because you're gonna get gravel on it, you're gonna get dust and things. And those little, even just little pieces of gravel or sand is enough to really make say a, a tall four foot wall, really get it out of level. So sweep off the bottom course before you put on the one on top of it. 
Sometimes some manufacturers, a block will recommend that you actually have, you actually scrape the bottom of the retaining wall block to knock off any imperfections of that block. All right. Let's get into patios. We don't have too much more time here. So I want to get into patios and, and cover some of the different types out there. Now, patios, they can be made of all different types of materials, concrete, stone, pavers, mortared pavers, gravel, asphalt, all so, so many things. So these, as these pictures show, you know, you can have so many things to create a walking or sitting surface. For this particular section, we are going to focus on unit pavers. Kind of like the modular retaining wall block. This is, could be anything like a concrete, manufactured concrete brick, brick, could be a clay brick, interlocking pavers. Essentially, you go to the, the home garden center, it's what you have access to there. They're designed to interlock together, unit pavers, You'll see in these pictures as we go forward, you know, examples of that. So we using this because this is usually what most homeowners are going to go for. They tend to have the most aesthetic appeal and the type of equipment needed to build this stuff is accessible to homeowners. That being said, laying pavers and retaining walls too can be considered an art by a lot of professionals out there. There's a lot, a lot of things that we can learn and talk about. Again, just covering the basics here in this and today, but there are some beautiful examples out there of true craftsmanship and, and installation methods to create a beautiful landscape. Okay, so preparation. As we begin building or preparing that site for unit pavers. This string line is, is like invaluable when it comes to building a patio. We would use a lot of string line. We would mark off the project site and then the string line doubles as a way to check our depth as we dig because unlike the retaining wall, we're kind of digging a trench. Here we're digging a large area and we're going to have to keep track of how deep we're going and then how deep is the material that we're adding into, the base material. So as, as you're doing this, you, you have your extents, you have your staking, your string line, you wanna ex excavate two foot beyond where your patio is actually going to be. This allows you a place to work, kind of like the retaining wall. Also, your patio should be higher than the surrounding grade or surrounding uh, landscape. That way water doesn't drain from the lawn onto the patio. So I've seen that happen actually quite a bit. And then the patio winds up becoming a silt depository for the lawn or say maybe a landscape bed nearby. So it's higher. This extra two foot of excavation gives you that room to match the edge of that patio to the, the grade of that surrounding landscape. So consider it the, the apron around the patio. So as we do this, like I said, you use your string line. Um, we use line levels to make sure that our string lines are, 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 are level with each other so that our measurement on one side is going to be similar to the one at the other side. So this is going to help you identify that you have dug down deep enough. Often, sometimes we would compact the subgrade and this is probably, in subgrade, I'm talking about bare dirt, the, just the dirt. So you've excavated, you're left with this, this wide area of dirt, bare dirt. That's the subgrade. New construction, as I mentioned before, that soil has no cohesive force. And a lot of times it's all mixed together. There's no structure. It's probably a good idea to run a compactor over it or a hand tamp. So you can do that. I, I would say... When it comes to compacting that subgrade, you know, if you can walk over it, if you can drive equipment over it and it leaves no ruts, it's compacted enough. A lot of our yards have a pretty compacted soil to begin with. So again, it's a case by case basis. If you're gonna also be installing uh, retaining walls that are kind of another feature of the patio, you're gonna level that slope and the wall will go in first. 
So walls are always first, you then do your patio behind that. For base material, so remember for the retaining wall, that was four to six inches recommended for a four foot wall height of your wall, uh, for a four foot tall wall. Typically for a pedestrian patio, paver patio, it is recommended to use four inches of that base material, that gravel. Plus with patios, we also need a one inch max, maximum, setting bed and that is made of sand. That's a sand setting bed. And then you have to figure in your paver height. So if you're trying to match this, say either with an existing patio, sidewalk, uh, maybe a, a stoop from a, a door, these are the things that you need to consider when you're digging down for that. And that's when the tape measure and the string line really comes in handy. As I mentioned, if soil is undisturbed, usually you don't need to pack it down. Again, new construction, definitely we would do it. If you're finding that it, the soil is just too soft, yes, you need to compact it. You can compact it using a, a pretty heavy plate, compa plate packer, as this person's using here. Those are just specifications that, that you could, you don't necessarily need to memorize that or anything, but delivering about 5,000 pounds of force, force per second. Oops. Essentially, you know that it's compacted again when you can drive equipment on there when, and there's no ruts. So if you have a, a riding mower, you can drive it on there and there's no, no tire marks, nothing like that. You know you're good. Sometimes, now I'm seeing this more and more, folks are putting down fabric, a geotextile fabric. Now this is where I, I will I also pause in the the, the, the presentation to, to show folks the difference between landscape fabric and geotextile fabric. They are not the same. They look very similar and a lot of times they're used interchangeably, but they are they are different materials. There are two types of geotextile fabric. There is the, the woven fabric, which looks very much like landscape fabric. There's also thermal spun bound material, kind of like a, a blanket would be. So that at this point you have a bare soil. Sometimes folks will put down a fabric. We typically wouldn't, but I do understand folks would do that to keep the soil separated from that, that gravel layer. But again, when it came to when I was doing landscaping, we usually wouldn't do that. But those are some of the things that you will find instructions online. So when it comes to your base material. Now we're back to gravel. We've excavated our area. You might have put fabric, geotextile fabric down. Maybe you didn't. But next is putting on that base material, which is once again, that compactable gravel. It has those, that, the, the small material, the fines in there that allows it to lock together. So as I mentioned with retaining walls, this base material needs to have moisture in it so it will compact properly. How do you know if there's enough moisture? Well, if you pick up a, a handful and you squeeze it in your hands, there should be enough moisture in there that a couple drops of water come out. Make two passes at different angles. Um, work from high to low. If you're a professional, you probably need to have, and, and this is a significantly large patio uh, or a commercial patio, you're going to want to have this checked by a geotechnical engineer. They can do a spike test, but one way you can do this is you can take, say, a shovel handle, turn it over, and jam the, the, the handle into the, that base material. If it doesn't leave a, a, an indentation, you're, you have a compacted base material. To identify any humps or depressions, we'd roll a pipe over. And we would, you know, bend over and see, well, there's a little hill there, or look, there's a little gap. That means there's a depression. We would either remove or add gravel as appropriate. And then we check our slope. Our patios were never like 0% slope, not perfectly level. We add anywhere from a half to one inch percent slope to them so that we make sure, because most patios on one side, there's a house and on the other side, there's a, a lawn. We wanna make sure that the water is draining away from the house and towards the lawn. 
And so here is a, a picture or example of that base material getting uh, run over with that plate, uh, vibrating, vibrating plate packer. They're moving just back and forth. Again, two different angles, two different directions, packs that material down. And that's what it'll look like. And this creates that first layer, the first surface um, that we're then gonna put our sand on. Now, when it comes to our setting bed or the sand, we're going to screed this to a consistent thickness of about an inch thick. Now that's the process, uh, the image there, the, the illustration, those, those two folks there, they have a board, it's a flat board. They even make screeding bars to do this, but you can use a two by four that doesn't have any uh, bends to it or uh, malformities. And you can pull that sand across two three quarter inch um, pipes sorry, one inch diameter pipes, and I'm talking outer diameter pipes. The inner diameter is probably three quarter inch. So the outer diameter from one outside to the other outside is at one inch. You have two of them, put sand down and you pull that board through there and it levels that sand. That's called the setting bed. Again, if you're trying to match your pavers with another walkway, the image below that Again, on the left, your board, you can cut a notch in it, which then matches that setting bed with that existing walkway surface. If you're trying to match this up, you have to accommodate an extra quarter inch. Okay, and I'll show you why. So the board should be notched, the thickness of the paver minus one quarter inch. That's because the paver is going to settle into that sanding bed. And I'll show you what, how that happens here next. So you, you pull that screed bar across there, you have a, a flat level area to begin laying your pavers. You don't wanna go more than one inch because sand does not have good cohesive force. And over time, those pavers could tip and shift very easily if you have too much sand there and only screed areas that can be paved immediately. So here in this, this image here, this, this gentleman is screeding this area. He's gonna lay pavers down. They're doing it bit by bit, section by section. And when it comes to patterns, you know, the basically you can create whatever comes into your brain. Paper patterns, they have so many different options and paper shapes near infinite. So in, in terms of different types listed here, hey, look at all these. There's so many different types of patterns that you can create just with bricks or a, like a brick shaped paper. So there's so many options available to you, whatever you prefer. Now, something to consider when you're setting these pavers. Recommend always having a soldier course which is essentially at the edge of the patio is a full course of pavers. This eliminates any of these little, see that in, in this image here on the right, there's these tiny little slivers of pavers. Now imagine if that was at the edge, those would fall off into the lawn, even with an edge restraint. So we wanna have a full paver on the edge, not only for structure stability, just looks good. Also look at sight lines through your door. Say if you have a picture window, think about centering your paver pattern with these views. So looking, say this is a prominent axis in this backyard here, that there is a, a line right here in the middle of that paver set that directs the eye backwards into the seating area. So the pattern is situated in the middle of this line going backwards. In terms of direction of pave, paving, a lot of times you're gonna go perpendicular to your edge. This works best with a square, <laughs> you know, no curves uh, on your patio. But if you have a, a, an irregularly shaped patio, this can be a little bit more difficult then usually you might start from the, the you know, from, from say the patio door, work your way out to the edge. Ideally, you wanna have as few cuts as possible 
and you want to try to avoid a- as much as possible. And I know it's it, it, probably not the tiny little slivers of pavers having to be placed in there, but it happens. Also, you have created this beautiful sand setting bed for your pavers. You will ruin that if you, instead of dropping the paver, so basically you click it, you lock it uh, to the paver next to it, and then you drop it. Now, not like with a lot of force, but you just sort of, you know, a very gentle drop. If you put it on the ground and then you scoot it into place, you have now ruined that setting bed. So it's the click and drop or click and place method. Click it up against the top of the next, the paver that's already there, and then drop it down. Again, there are instructions for the different patterns and things like that that you can you can have with your pa- your your pavers. Well, let's talk about edging real quick. Now, edging. Sometimes the manufacturer will say, "Hey, put this uh, on early in the construction process." Sometimes it'll be later. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Sometimes they'll specify the type of edging to use or pay restraint to use. But pictured here is a concrete toe, and I am not a fan of these edge restraints, a concrete toe, mainly because I come in afterwards and I want to, say, plant something, some bedding plants, and I put my trowel on the ground. Ow, I just broke my wrist because I just hit, hit a concrete toe that's buried underneath there. Other times, we will put sod or we'll, we'll seed grass up to the edge of that patio. How well do you think that grass is going to grow with that concrete toe right there? Not very well. I think they're ugly. In our freeze-thaw environment, they break very easily. And then you will have a patio that walks or floats, which means there's no edge restraint and pavers are moving, and that's not good. But again, you can go online and find video after video after video of people installing these edge restraints. Folks, we have to remember that There are people who live in places other than where we're at here in Illinois that might not have a freeze-thaw cycle like what we do. If you have questions, talk to a landscaper in your area. They know the conditions of the soils, the moisture, the freeze-thaw cycle. They, they, They know. Some videos are people doing this in California where it doesn't freeze. So maybe the concrete toe holds up better. In terms of edge restraints, these are just a lot of different construction details of what you can do. Concrete backfill, a spike, a steel spike. You can create a concrete curb. Um, You can turn a brick over on its edge and set it in place. You can do wooden edging with a wooden stake. A lot of what is used these days is this plastic flexible edging. They hammer in uh, metal pins, not into every, necessarily every single hole that you see here, but every other, every three or four, they'll hammer those in, that locks that edge into place, much more easier to use than, say, having to excavate a trench and, like, say, do a concrete curb. Remember when I said to accommodate for that quarter inch of uh, settling? This is why. Because when you set your pavers on that one inch sand setting bed, We want to then seat those pavers into that sand, which means we run a a, a compactor like what you see here that has a rubber mat on the bottom. We run a very lightweight compactor over it, which then seats those pavers into that sand, which means they're going to drop about a quarter inch. And about a quarter inch of sand is going to rise in that bottom joint, and it's going to lock those pavers from the bottom. And so that's something that important to remember. So we can seat pavers, they can lock them into that setting bed sand in the bottom. You probably, or you might, repl- break some pavers. Just replace those. If you don't have restrained edges, so say you didn't do this, you don't want to be running your pack, your plate packer next to the edge like what this person's doing right here. So we've locked them in from the bottom. Now we're gonna lock them into the top by sweeping the joints. And essentially we're taking coarse sand, we're dumping this out on the patio and at a, in a diagonal fashion in two directions, we are going to sweep the sand into the joints. And this locks the 
top portion of the pavers in place by sweeping the, the sand into the joints. A lot of people ask also about this poly sand or polymeric sand. This is essentially sand with a polymer in it, which binds it together. The reason for using this is it helps to keep weeds down. It can last for a long time, but it does eventually begin to fall apart. And in order to add new poly sand to an area, most manufacturers that I am familiar with recommend you have to totally remove existing polymer, polymer sand before you can apply new poly sand. So that's a lot of work. I like to use plain sand. I think I'm just maybe an old timer in that regard. You can do it once a year. You get a couple, like a bag or two of sand for your patio. You sweep it into the joints. You sweep off all the extra. The other thing about poly sand is you have to make sure that you're following directions very, 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 very closely because once you sweep the poly sand into the joints, if you don't clean off the surface of those pavers of all that extra poly sand, because the next part of this is usually you have to water it down. You have to water that poly sand to activate that polymer. If there's still poly sand on that surface, you get what's called a haze or a hazing effect on those pavers, which you can see in this photo on the right, on the right side, the, you see the pavers have like this haze to them. That's because they were watered in without sweeping that poly sand off of there. And so make sure that you're doing, you know, being very, very careful and reading instructions very closely with this stuff. Now, we've covered a lot today, but really this is the basics. There's so much more we could talk about. Just wanted to end with a very, uh, a beautiful picture here shared uh, with me uh, by Nancy, our moderator today, uh, about what can be with hardscaping. It's a lot of work. It does take particular skill and talent, but you can create some really beautiful places that will last a lifetime in your yard. So with that, that's who I am. 